Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> This is awesome! Hello and welcome once again to a retro wrestling review for Cheap Shot Entertainment. Also on the podcasting channel, Talk is Cheap. As ever, I am your host Luke and you are the Cheap Shot Nation. And we're zooming through the year 2004 with a pay-per-view that has come back after four years of absence. Last chance... Uh, it had to appear was obviously in WCW before it was bought by Vince McMahon and became pretty much extinct. We still do have the Great American Bash now. It is part of NXT rather than the main roster, but back in 2004 they bought it back. And you had people featured such as John Cena, Kurt Angle, JBL. And Eddie Guerrero on this card. The main narrative of which is Americans are better than everybody else. And even the opening promo was the Legion, uh, Pledge Allegiance to the Flag uh, st said by kids. Um, yeah, okay. America! Um, <clears throat> so it took place 20 years ago to the day. That is the 27th of June 2004. It was a Smackdown exclusive and attended by a mere 6,500 fans in uh, Virginia. Um, so, Norfolk, Virginia, in fact. So, um, yeah, let's, let's get on. It is a Smackdown only pay per view. Here's an exclusive. And uh, the main event was The Undertaker versus The Dudley Boys. I'm not going to go into any more detail of that because this match is absolutely infamous. And if you know what I'm talking about, you can find videos online of the uh, incident in, <laughs> in question. Um, the game uh, that this arena appears in is two. It's Smackdown vs. Raw 2006, which is really weird because obviously this is a 2004 pay-per-view. And Day of Reckoning 2. So, um, yeah, doesn't appear on very many games, this. Just before we get into the main card, because you never get the Sunday Night Heat. Although, I suppose you could on the network get the Sunday Night Heat. Maybe for next month I'll look at the Sunday Night Heat as well. But I do find the network really difficult to navigate on a smart telly. Um, so maybe next week, uh, next month, I will uh, have a look at the Sunday Night Heat match as well before the show. But for the purpose of this one, Spike Dudley defeats Jamie Noble. And that is it. So we're going into the main card now. So um, yeah, let's get on to the first match. And we go into the first match, which happens to be for the United States Championship. It is a fatal four-way elimination match. And if you don't know what that is, basically there's four competitors in the ring. And as people are pinned or submitted, Count, well, there's no count out, so there's no rules necessarily in this match. As they are submitted or, or pinfold, they get eliminated. So this is John Cena defending his United States Championship, of course, one against the Big Shot WrestleMania 20, against Booker T, Rob Van Dam, and Rene Dupree. Because Kurt Angle can't stand an American being the United States Champion. <laughs> um, 
Oh, right, okay, so a uh, lot to unpack here. A lot of this match, uh, they do start off all four of them beating each other up, but then it sort of splits off, and you only ever get two people in the ring at the same time, which is okay. But why aren't the other two people sort of going after each other, wearing them down? It doesn't feel like it's real. Well, obviously, it's wrestling, but one thing we're always taught is to make people feel like it is real. Like you have a genuine hatred, a genuine reason to be having this match with someone. Um, obviously, the reason here is the title. But... Yeah, quite often feels like you're playing a game in SmackDown vs Raw 2006 where two people are in the ring and the other two people just stood outside watching. <laughs> um, so that is a mute point. So I'm going to take a cheap shot off for that. The rest of the match was solid. Uh, did what it needed to do. Van Damme hits two five-star frog splashes. One on Rene Dupree, one on Booker T. It is then John Cena who comes in and rolls Van Dam up. I thought that was a, a cheap way to get Van Dam out, but it does increase the heat on Cena with two heels versus one face. Um, so, but it is about survival. It's every man for himself, and that is what John Cena's character is about. It's survival, isn't it? At this point, so it's thugonomics, Cena, by the way. You can hear squeaking in the background. And I'm for that match, start, just before we move on, um, uh, I'm going to give that Rene one Dupree a three cheap shots out After of five. A, uh, an FU. And uh, Booker T would come in and hit the scissors kick on Cena, but then cover Rene Dupree, um, who had had time to um, sort of recover from that. So um, I don't know if that sort of went a little bit wrong but uh, yeah um, Rene Dupree goes out next and uh, we then get the one-on-one -on -one. and this is where the match starts to shine a little bit you've got John Cena who is a young up-and-comer at this point he's done amazing things so far and obviously a uh, veteran in Book T the last ever WCW champion so yeah it gets um, Gets a little bit better from here, and uh, John Cena hits the FU on Booker T to retain his championship after a hard fought third act of this match. Now, like I said, it kind of feels like I'm playing a game in SmackDown vs. Raw 2006. So it's, like I say, often someone standing around, which is not great, you know, as a visual, you want people to go after each other, right? So, uh, yeah, with John Cena retaining, uh, that was definitely the right decision. Uh, I'm going to give this match three cheap shots out of five. Cena retains and does all of the eliminating apart from Rene Dupree. Also been joined by Tilly the dog. Hello, Tilly. Hello. If you love dogs, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Um, so we'll move on to the next match, and it is a filler match between Luther Reigns and Charlie Haas. Straight after the match, John Cena is celebrating his victory. Walks past Charlie Haas and Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie then proclaims that. Now he's done a good job tonight. John Cena then proceeds to hit on her, even though Charlie Haas is hitting on her as well. He does nothing. Um, so at that point, they carry on flirting with each other and Kurt Angle rolls in uh, with his broken leg in his wheelchair and says, you used to be something. You used to be my protege and I don't know how you've fallen off the wagon. Um, Charlie Haas immediately comes back and says, I don't care. So well, you should care. Because I've got a bigger, badder protege and you're going to wrestle him next. That bigger, badder protege is Luther Reigns. Yes. Um, that being said, you know, this match is really impressive from Luther Reigns. He, he had, did go a bit further downhill when he started going against bigger and 
uh, bigger talent than Charlie Haas. Uh, not to disparage Charlie Haas uh, or you know poo poo on his on his legacy. He was multiple time tag tag team champion, part of Team Angle. Really cool. Um, but when he went uh, on the singles run because of the brand split, both him and Shelton Benjamin just didn't really do much. Say Shelton got a bit more rub of the green, but uh, yeah, Charlie Haas didn't really go anywhere, <laughs> um, which is a damn shame because he was very, very good. Anyway, uh, this match is Charlie Haas with Miss Jackie and uh, versus Luther Reigns with Kurt Angle and his red, white and blue wheelchair. And uh, yeah, Charlie Haas starts off um, with the amateur wrestling stuff. Uh, it, was, it isn't long before Luther Reigns does come back and use his massive size and power to overcome that initial charge from Charlie Haas. Uh, it would end with... Uh, clean, might add, it would end clean with a reverse twisting DDT from Luther Reigns. Uh, uh, basically what is a crossroads without him, without Luther Reigns twisting over as well. Um, so, yeah, um, it sounded nasty. You got the crowd reaction from it because otherwise they were very quiet. And... Um, yeah, it was an okay match. It was okay. Just okay. Um, so we've not got off to a great start in this pay-per-view, but um, I'm not confident that it'll get any better. Anyway, um, we uh, we move on uh, from that. I'm going to give that a two cheap shots out of five. Moving into the backstage area now, uh, we get a uh, promo from JBL. He says he promised victory at Judgment Day. He guaranteed you victory at Judgment Day. And he delivered victory at Judgment Day. The Eddie Guerrero got himself disqualified on purpose, but he still delivered victory. Now, in the Texas Bull Rope match, he cannot get disqualified because it is no... It has no rules, basically. So uh, the Texas Bull Rope match, like a dog collar match, um, uh, there's a couple of others as well um, where you have to touch all four corners and you're attached to each other by the wrist. And uh, yeah, once you touch all four corners, you won the match. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> hey, Fever. Hey, hey, Fever. Uh, can I get a hell yeah? Um, anyway. Um, so, yeah, we move on to the next match. Moving on now, and uh, we've got a Cruiserweight Championship match. And it is between the reigning defending champion, Rey Mysterio, and the former champion, Chavo Guerrero. Now, I wasn't expecting very much from this match, but what I actually got was an absolute delight. It was a really, really, really good match. Um, there was it was very varied. There was submissions, there was finishing move, transition moves, uh, high flying moves, as you'd expect from um, any cruiserweight championship match. There was definite peril in there as well, um, because there was times where Chavo was. Very close, and you believed, even though I've seen this pay-per-view before, believed that um, Chavo was going to win. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't until the very last moment where Chavo had Rey Mysterio in a single-leg Boston Crab, having worked over the leg, so it told a good story here as well. And... Um, it wasn't until that point where Ray was crawling and, and really fighting to try and get out of this match, uh, out of the uh, move, that things really, you knew that it was very close. So the finish uh, wasn't an actual recognised finish from either of these guys. It was uh, 
Chavo Guerrero going for a gory bomb. Rey Mysterio countering it into a sort of flipping sent on sunset flip. Um, so it would be the equivalent of the Canadian Destroyer or a Panama Sunrise uh, without the bouncing, uh, jumping bit first. So, um, yeah, it's um, a case of, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's like a really good match. If you're going to go back and watch one match out of this pay-per-view uh, so far, it would be this one. Um, I would highly recommend this to anyone who is training to be a wrestler, who is uh, on the smaller side, who wants to do the sort of high-flying cruise weight stuff. This is the one. Uh, this is a really, really good match. Not only accomplished in the mat wrestling side, but also, like I say, very varied uh, in what it did. And like I say, it told a great story. I'm going to give this one a very respectable four and a half cheap shots out of five. I very much enjoyed this. and It, it could be the peak of the pay-per-view. It, it could very well be downhill from here. But we've still got the ball rope match. We've still got a couple of singles matches and a divas match as well. Because they were divas then. Um, so yeah, let's move on, shall we? And moving on to the next match now, it is Kenzo Suzuki, as uh, Jim Rush would say later on down the line, versus Billy Gunn. Uh, Kenzo has come into monstrous fanfare. Um, ne the next big thing, a bit like Mordecai, um, all these new faces coming in, which is great. But uh, Kenzo... Uh, Whilst decent, it was very generic. Um, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, we need we need some more foreign talent. Let's get some from Japan, and we'll call him Kenzo Suzuki. Let's name him after two brands. <laughs> um, yeah, one clothes and one a car. Anyway, um, he defeats Billy Gunn with a very um yeah mediocre move shall we say um but nonetheless he defeats billy gunn and uh, again nothing to write home about with this match um billy gunn obviously looking decent at the time um uh, having just come out of the dx thing not not too much uh before this really and uh, yeah Looking, he's looking good. This was before the Billy and Chuck thing, so yeah. Um, but the match itself, two cheap shots out of five. Again, like I say, nothing to write home about. But it's just going to get sadly worse from here because next we have Sable and Tori Wilson. They even get a promo package to say how much they hate each other. And how much Sable is jealous of Tori Wilson because she is on the cover of the Divas magazine. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, to be fair to both of these ladies, it, it, you can tell that they have been in training, um, just not been given enough time because the Obviously, the, the women's title at this point is on Raw exclusively, and the Cruiserweights are on SmackDown exclusively. So, there's not much reason for these ladies to be on a pay-per-view match, but I suppose it, it does need breaking up, and you do need to have that, um, that representation on a pay-per-view, because they didn't have any actually trained women's wrestlers on Smackdown or at least not many of them anyway at this point so yeah again another very mediocre match there's some bits here drop toe hold that went wrong I'm not even sure how you can do a drop toe hold wrong but 
We did, we missed it, um, and it looked, looked awful. Um, and it was more about ogling the two, which is really sad. Very, very sad uh, state of affairs on SmackDown for the women's division in 2004. But again, there's not much to write home about here in terms of a match, because there wasn't really one. Um, so I'm going to give this one... One and a half cheap shots out of five. I feel like because they went out there and they did put on a match and they did try, um, that deserves the extra half star, uh, half cheap shot rather. But other than that, not great. <laughs> uh, we're spinning wildly out of control in this uh, pay-per-view. But wait... There's more, <laughs> um, because next you have Mordecai, the guy who is basically the uh, negative version of The Undertaker, or at least trying to be, everything's white including his hair, going against Hardcore Holly. Now, Harker Holly is well known for his badassery, just wanting to beat up trainees. Um, I'm not sure how that translates to badassery. I think it just just bit of a dick. But, you know, um, yeah, this is a match. At least this did have uh, uh, some decent things in it. Uh, Hardcore Holly uh, fighting as much as he could against Mordecai, but they were really pushing Mordecai at the time. Uh, everything about Mordecai had the intention to go places. When you watch the pay-per-view, whether this was his music or not, his music kind of killed the thing for me. Um, it could have been more in keeping with the character. He's like a dark angel, uh, it's supposed to be a messenger from God uh, to strike vengeance upon thee, that kind of thing. Um, but his music is very heel and generic. Um, yeah, it kind of, that, that part kind of took me out of the entrance and out of the character, really. Um, I'm going to give this another go, but yeah, that's it. It comes down with the staff, puts it in a block. Looks very really cool, you know, a bit like the... Uh, um, Drew McIntyre with the sword he had the stone to put it in didn't he um, but yeah this is nowhere near Drew McIntyre levels but Mordecai would eventually win with kind of like a uh, well it was just a uh, oh no it wasn't it was a uh, basically a razor's edge it was a crucifix bomb on uh, Hardcore Holly, who would uh, succumb and be Mordecai's next victim. I'm going to give this one ooh, two cheap shots out of five. Again, not great, serviceable, just a match um, in terms of what SmackDown had to offer. Um, and then we get on to the double main event because it is John Bradshaw Layfield going up against the current WWE Undisputed Champion uh, or the WWE Champion as it is at this point in time because they do have the World Championship on Raw and um Guerrero uh, defending his championship in a Texas bull rope match. Now, if you don't know what one of those is, it's where one wrestler is attached to one end of a rope and the other is attached to the other, uh, and there's a cowbell in between. So you can use that as a weapon. It is a no disqualification match, and... Uh, the idea is that no one can get away from each other. So, you know, you can use 
the posts, you can use the ball rope, you can use the cowbell, um, and, and pretty much anything in between, really, and that's pretty much what they do here. Um, there's also a rule which I thought was interesting, whereas if you um, physically, noticeably, try and take the rope off your wrist, then you are disqualified and lose the match. Um, which is a nice little touch, I found. I found that to be a nice little touch because quite often you have these matches and one competitor removes their arm from one side and uh, then just gets the advantage, really. So I thought that was interesting. Surprised they didn't use that as a sort of ref distraction spot. But they didn't, and they just beat the snot out of each other, and I always appreciate that. Because when you feel like it's real, you get invested in a match. Um, so, yeah, um, both guys... Actually, no, only it's only uh, Layfield that gets busted open here with a vicious chair shot quite early on in the match. And... Um, well, that's when they start fighting outside and chucking each other over the announce desks and and things like that. And uh, yeah, from there, Layfield would go hurtling into a post. There wouldn't be very many wrestling moves here. There, there is a frog splash, um, ironically. But obviously, the intention is that you have to touch all four turnbuckles uh, in a row without it being interrupted if it's being if it's physically interrupted the count starts again so uh, yeah um, this match yeah like I say it's not really much of a match but it is a battle it is a fight and I do like those kind of matches within reason and say so that the blood side of it there was a reason for it he got smacked over the head with a chair it was a blood feud and I can I can deal with that in terms of that um, so extra points and uh, yeah a um, couple of times uh, both competitors did manage to touch at least three of the posts before getting blocked. Um, obviously, you can roll out the ring here and stop your opponent reaching that fourth post because obviously the rope's not long enough. Very clever, and uh, yeah, it would eventually lead to uh, both guys in the ring um, battling each other. They both touched. It was Eddie Guerrero dragging JBL around the ring, touching all three. Three posts out of four. JBL cleverly touching them straight afterwards, feigning sort of injury uh, and being knocked out. He would stumble around the fourth post. Let's make this very clear. Um, Eddie Guerrero, he would fight back at that point. Eddie Guerrero would then go for the jump and leap over the top of JBL. Only for only to touch the touch the top turnbuckle and retain his championship. Um, <laughs> only for Kurt Angle to come out and say, actually, <laughs> JBL's shoulder touched the turnbuckle first. You can't argue with that, actually, and uh, he is now the new WWE champion. So uh, yes, uh, another transitional champion and JBL would go on to hold this championship until Wrestlemania the next year so he would have a very good run with it uh, Eddie Guerrero got what four months with the championship um, and to lose it like that and never really got another another look in I think he did get a re rematch but yeah this is the problem when you've got um, heel uh, general managers and they did go through a few general managers on Smackdown I've got to say Eric Bischoff was there for a while 
but uh, SmackDown went through a few phases of uh, general manager. And uh, yeah, we now got Kurt Angle with his broken leg and Luther Reigns. Um, but yeah, the match itself was really entertaining, very good. Both guys made you believe that they hated each other and they, you know, they wanted to win that championship and it was the most important thing. And that is great. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give this one four sheep shots out of five. Definitely one of the better matches on the card uh, behind the cruiserweight match, and that's you know I think the cruiserweight match is the uh, is the best match on this card on this pay per view. Um, but yeah, this match was really good as well. Just proved that uh, JBL could go, uh, but this would be a, a marker for the rest of his reign, really. Uh, which we'll get into, obviously, in, in the months to come. But, uh, yeah, Eddie Guerrero wins his championship. And uh, the main event. I was dreading coming up to this, but uh, as they build it uh, on the internet, the live free or die match, um, otherwise known as the Concrete Crypt. Now, this is... An infamous match for the wrong reasons. Now, <laughs> um, it is The Undertaker versus the Dudley Boys. The Dudley Boys are currently SmackDown Tag Team Champions. So they're tied up in this match, which means we didn't get a WWE Tag Team Championship match. And, uh, yeah, so they come out, Dudley Boys, Steve on Dudley, Bubba Ray Dudley, from Dudleyville, along with Paul Heyman. Um, they come out. And you see uh, Paul Bearer in uh, a glass case with a cement mixer next to him. Um, <laughs> um, I don't really want to try and describe this to you if you haven't seen it. It's got to be seen to be believed, but watch at your own caution. Um, because this match is absolutely awful. It's an awful premise. And uh, I don't think there's, there's very rarely a, a mention of it these days. But uh, yeah, uh, so basically the Dudley boys kidnapped Paul Bearer. They've been torturing him doing whatever, and they coax The Undertaker to do the right thing uh, into this match, which he did, um, and you can save your manager, you can save your friend of 14 years, <coughs> um, in this match where your friend may die. Um, <laughs> um, Almost as bad as an eye for an eye match, really. Um, you can expect some hokey stuff with wrestling, definitely, but uh, this may be a bit too hokey for me. Um, yeah, so uh, Paul Bearer in the glass case uh, with the cement mixer next to him. And uh, Undertaker makes his entrance, and we immediately get Paul Heyman on the microphone. Now, I'll never really complain about Paul Heyman being on the microphone, but in this case, it is bloody awful. Uh, interrupting the match every five minutes, you can see that the uh, audience had been sucked away from the action um, because of this massive cement mixer truck that was leaning over Paul Bearer. Sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Cheers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, um, yeah, the match, again, it wasn't really much of a match. There was a few bits in there. I think the Dudley boys were supposed to tag in and out, but the referee just gave in with that very quickly. There was a one point where Paul Bearer comes down to the ring. Undertaker sits up and goes for him. Uh, Paul Bearer's got the urn, so he's got the power over the Undertaker. And, uh, yeah. That's pretty much it. All the way through the match, every time Undertaker did something big, like 
old school or uh, they made a comeback. Paul, Paul Heyman got on the mic. Bad dog, bad dog, bad dog. Train my big dog, that kind of thing. Um, and he was pulling the lever to release the cement. So there's a bit of peril there, oh no. Uh, you know, the cement's coming up to his knees, it's up to his chest, that kind of thing. Um, realistically, I don't think any state would have signed this off, so who knows how they did it. It looks pretty pretty real in terms of the concrete mix. Um, I'm guessing they might have used oatmeal or something like that, but uh, yeah, who knows. The trickery of the WWE. Um, and then Undertaker would eventually win uh, against the Dudley Boys and win the match. So not only <laughs> have you buried the tag team champions on your brand by having them lose in a two-on-one handicap match, the next part would bury the brand even further after such a good start in 2002 by The Undertaker saying, I'm sorry Paul, this is what I have to do, pulling the lever and burying his friend in concrete. Yes, you heard it <laughs> right here. He buried Paul Bearer in concrete. Um, I can't even give this match a rating. I'm going to give it a zero, and I think uh, that's been fair. Um, you know, the match wasn't really a match. The concept was absolutely bloody awful. And uh, although, you know, you to, to hear it, you go, oh, what's that? <laughs> and it's that, that morbid curiosity, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's it's bad. Um, this, this is not a good pay-per-view. I would not go back and give this pay-per-view your time. Apart from the Cruiserweight Championship match, it's pretty awful. Um, so, not recommend the pay-per-view overall. The Cruiserweight Championship match was spot on. So if you uh, do feel the need to... Uh, you know, watch a match on this card. Eddie, uh, Chavo Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, spot on. Um, so, that is Great American Bash. Uh, they brought it back to a lot of fanfare. So, hey, we're bringing back this old pay-per-view. How cool is that? And um, it is cool, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just I felt sorry for the fact that um, this classic pay per view name, Great American Bash, had to come back to this. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's pretty much it. So, moving on now to the next pay per view. It is the Vengeance 2004, which is a Raw brand exclusive. If you remember last year, it was a SmackDown brand exclusive, I believe. And uh, it was on July the 11th. And uh, the uh, main event was Chris Benoit versus Triple H. Of course it was. Why wouldn't it be? It's in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, yeah, we'll be watching that and talking through it later on this year, on July the 11th, incidentally. Um, so yeah, if you enjoyed the pay-per-view rundowns, I've uh, been doing it now for four years, started in COVID, a uh, bit of a side project because I was a bit bored um, being furloughed and trying to keep it going. It's... Uh, takes time obviously so the more listeners I get it makes it worthwhile doing and I love watching the pay-per-views anyway so uh, yeah hoping you're enjoying these thoughts on wrestling and um, you know would say much like I say with the movies if you want to go and watch it go and watch it if you've got curiosity about it uh, you'll hear a lot of things about Great American Bash 2004 
most of them negative, but hardly any of them talk about that Cruiserweight Championship match. I do feel like, um, you know, a bit like in actual human history, wrestling history sometimes needs to be watched um, to appreciate the, the stuff that we have now uh, and how big wrestling is now and the sacrifices that people made to uh, make that happen. But uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll speak to you again on Vengeance Day on June, July the 11th. And I'll see you there. Thank you very much wrestling fans and goodbye. Hiya!